Okay, so um, this one is a, uh, we're going to kind of go through a, a lovely thought here about the Lord Jesus being in the midst. And you'll see these little subtitles here. We have used this for the Brazilian uh, broadcast. And so um, this has been a tremendous uh, encouragement to me over, over many, many years, uh, walking uh, with the Lord, being gathered to his name uh, for, oh, well, let's see here, nigh under probably 38 years now. And so uh, I'm going to bring together some meditations from many years ago, but then some from, from, from re more recent here. There's going to be a variety of scriptures, a handful of scriptures that we're going to have here on the Lord's life as he's walking through the Gospels. And it's just a small handful of these, and it's lovely to see this. These were brought out to me, as I said, as I was in my uh, late teens, early 20s, and uh, kind of bringing these here. And I, and I just want to go through these and just meditate a little bit upon them. It says in Luke 2, 46, And it came to pass, after three days they found him, he's 12 years old, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And here we, we, we enjoyed early on uh, in our webinar series here of aspect of the Lord Jesus having particular glories when he was even a boy, even before in the 30 years of silence, if you will. So here is here's the Lord Jesus, 12 years old, with a particular glory about him. And I so enjoyed in, in week uh, two where Cornell talked about the glories of the Lord Jesus when he was a boy. And this to me shows the fact that he's 12 years old and he's sitting and he's listening and hearing him. And, and when I, when I, when I see there that they're asking him questions, why that means that, that they realize he has something to say. So there he is in the midst in that particular, in that particular aspect. We're now going to have three verses here, three particular sections where the Lord Jesus is not being appreciated in the midst. In fact, in two of the three, he's not even being seen. Uh, he's not even being seen in the midst. And so it says here in Luke 4, uh, 28, and all they that are in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. So there he is, again, in the midst. And notice the fact, and it's just, this is um, interesting to see here, and I uh, use the little pen here, is that this all comes out of the synagogue, the very place where the, the God was being spoken of or should have been spoken of, that, that when um, he was in the synagogue, they were then desirous to cast him out of the synagogue and, and cast him headlong. Um, but he passed through the midst of them, and they, he didn't, they did not see him. So that's the first aspect we have there. And then we have in John 8, where we see here, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so here we have another similar situation. This time's not in the synagogue. He was in the temple. And this time they were not going to throw him down from the brow of the hill. They were going to cast stones at him. Again, seeing the blessed Lord Jesus in their midst, and they're willing to cast stones. The third verse that we get on, on the Lord Jesus being in the midst and their antagonism, their jealousy, their rage says in John 19, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. You know, and it reminds me of that verse in um, Psalm 22, where it says, many bowls have compassed me, strong bowls of Bashan have beset me round. You know, and it says there that they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. And to think that there on that cross, the Lord Jesus was again in the midst, it says. And there was, yes, there's in between two thieves, but there were many that were surrounding him. He was in the midst. And to see them crucify him there on that hill. 
Now, we get a couple instances here coming out in his resurrected state and where he's in the midst, and we find actually two of them in the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. And I don't have the one that I wanted in front of me, so I'm going to read it there because it's the earlier one where it says, as I turn to it here, then the same day at even, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. So that's uh, John uh, 20, 19. And there he is. And we see a couple things here. And then later on, eight days later, and after being eight days again, his disciples are within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And so we, we find a couple things here. We find out that, first of all, it is the first day of the week is when he appears in his resurrected state. And the second thing, second thing we read about in these two, uh, two verses here is that it's all about peace be unto you. Peace when he's in our midst. Think about that. Peace when he's in our midst. And then one thing I like about this, too, is, is um, you know, the disciples go out. We have seen the Lord, right? And how precious it is when we see the Lord in the midst to go out and tell others that we saw him in the midst. And then we find this verse, John 20, 26, where Thomas shows up, right? How precious that is to see that Thomas didn't want to miss out again and uh, the excitement of the disciples to do that. Let's proceed. I like to and I like to tie this in now with uh, Jesus or Jehovah. He wanted to be in the midst as as it relates to the tabernacle. You know, we have a couple a couple drawings here, and and it's just kind of nice to get a handle on it. Where you have the courtyard around there, and you have the tabernacle back there, and you have all the encampment gathered around him, or around the, the, the tabernacle. More importantly, too, you've got the, uh, the fire uh, that was showing that he was in the midst. And so let's go into this a little deeper here to see. Here we have the 12 tribes. I thought this was a nice, tr uh, a nice um, slide here where we have the 12 tribes all gathered around uh, the encampment inside the, the, the tabernacle. And then, of course, you have Levi's, uh, Levi's the, the families of Levi um, sitting there as well. But the most important thing is, is right directly in the center there, there's the Holy of Holies. That's where, that's where the Shekinah glory dwelt. That's where God himself was putting himself in the midst of that camp. And I think that's just so beautiful to see that he wants to dwell in the midst of that people at that time. And just to get a handle on that, you know, um, as, as things work, when, when a man brings his lamb in, the first stop he had to make was the brazen altar. We'll go over that a little bit. And then obviously the blood from that or, or blood from that would could possibly go all the way back into the Holy of Holies. And there's going to be three different uh, pieces of furniture sitting right there. I'd like to cover just one of them. Obviously, before he uh, before that goes back, why the brazen altar? Or I'm sorry, the labor is sitting there, the labor to wash, to cleanse the priest as he goes back in. But when you read the scripture, you find out that the um, the way God presents it is He starts right back here. He starts right back here in the holy of holies and talks about the ark of the covenant. And I think that's just a tremendous thing to see, to see that God starts with His holiness and then. Um, shows us he shows us how we can approach god but uh, read the scriptures and in that in that order that's what's beautiful there here's another uh, illustration of this uh, the, the thing i like about this illustration is the fact that uh, the altar is is active um but then there is indeed there is indeed the 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 pillar of fire at night and the cloud at, at day to protect him is showing that god uh, was with them uh, in the center of their of their encampment. 
First thing I'd like to do is bring up the brazen altar here, and it, it, this again is the first thing that um, someone, if they brought in their lamb, their 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 goat, their their bull, this was the first thing. <clears throat> this is the actually really the the only thing that they probably got to see. They couldn't probably go beyond that um, in, in leading the animal in. So I'd like to just take a couple couple items from this. I know there's a ton of of meditation on this but I just wanted to take a couple meditations. Exodus 27. Thou shalt make the altar of acacia wood <clears throat> five cubits the length, five cubits the breadth. The altar shall be square and the height thereof three cubits. And then I brought out here, I, I want, whoop. I brought out here the fact that um, in verse five it says, and thou shalt put under the ledge of the altar beneath, and the net shall be in the very middle of the altar. And one thing I've enjoyed about this, if I can get my pin to operate here, is we find here that the uh, top to bottom was going to be three cubits, three cubits long, or uh, tall rather. And um, make my three cubits tall, and um, we see here that in this fifth verse here, that the very middle of the altar, very middle of the altar would be one and a half cubits, okay? So that's kind of an interesting little measurement as we go along. We find out the grate was dropped down halfway down the altar, and we find that the animals were put on inside that, on top of that grate, and it was one and a half cubits above the ground. So as we proceed on here, we'll come back to that. As we proceed on, let's go on past the the veil, and let's look at the uh, the Ark of the Covenant in just a moment here. We have the Ark of the Covenant here, and um, and we see here the uh, cherubims here. We're going to read about that real quickly. And then we have the mercy seat. <clears throat> it says in Exodus 25:10, they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So I just wanted to just, again, look at this for a moment. And we have one and a half cubits sitting there as well the same height and there shall I meet with thee and will speak with thee from above the mercy seat for between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony everything that I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel and so it's beautiful to see that this was where God deemed to dwell because of the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat you know inside there <clears throat> was a couple items but notably it was the uh it was the law, the commandments, the and, and the holiness of God, and to find out that, uh, you know, God was chose to dwell in a, that type of people, and you know, we as people, we're no different, are we? We're no different, and yet the blood that was from the altar, the brazen altar out there, was brought in and sprinkled on that mercy seat to to withhold the God's righteousness, God's righteousness being satisfied. But let's head back out here for a moment here. I don't want to touch too long on this, but the fact is, is that there is, that God is in the center of the Israelite company there in that situation in, in the Ark of the Covenant. Now we come on out and we find here, as we come out, we find a uh, table of showbread. Now in this particular artist rendering, why, this is uh, a little weak, I, I would think. I would think that the <clears throat> artist rendering better would be here. And it says, And thou shalt make a table of acacia wood, two cubits the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Okay? So here's here's the uh, the same the same height here as well. And it says, And it should be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy unto him, of Jehovah's offerings by fire, it is an everlasting statute. And you know what's beautiful about this is we as we look on the table of showbread, is you know there are a total of twelve loaves, is there not? And we have these loaves sitting here, and and we have these priests would gather around. I don't know if around or around the inside here, and they eat of that on a weekly basis. They eat the loaves. And it's nice to see that all 
12 tribes are identified there in those loaves. And you and I have the same thing. We have the same privilege where we have one loaf showing one body once a week that we partake of. And that's what's beautiful about it is that there is full representation there and uh, shows communion here. So there's there's the measurement there. There's the 12 loaves and the, and the, and the priests were going to be eating of it. So just to recap here, uh, the brazen altar, you know, that shows the fact that there is substitution for myself. I bring that lamb in. I bring that bull in. I'm bringing that animal in if I was in that day because that animal had to die for me. I recognize the fact that I'm a sinner and that there was something there, and I had and I am much in need of a substitution. And then we have, moving on here, we have the mercy seat. Again, the mercy seat was at the top of the Ark of the Covenant there. This is where God's righteous claims were met, right? The blood that was taken off of the, the, the brazen altar, once a year the blood was applied to the mercy seat. And there's significance to that, uh, but the, 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 the point here is that God's righteous claims were met. And before I go any further here, I've enjoyed these thoughts, and others have brought these to my attention. I think it's just, it's just, it's just beautiful here, where you know here we get the substitution, and here we get this propitiation, okay, and then both of these bring in the atonement, you know, and and that just. God's ways are so beautiful, and to see different components of a particular, um, you know, we're in this body, we're in this creation, we're, we're, we're in, and to see these heavenly things brought forth in this manner is absolutely beautiful. But let's not let's not stop there. We now have communion with priests, right? And so that's the that's the the the, the beautiful thing is now. I drew a line here because, again, I've already mentioned this, where, you know, we have this 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 little meditation I've enjoyed, where, you know, it's it's two and a quarter feet, or, you know, in the scripture it says one and a half cubit. We have the same height here, here, and here, the same height, and then you know, one and a half cubit or two and a quarter feet, that's not that high. It's not that high at all to see um, where the animal sacrifice was laid on, where the blood was put on the mercy seat, and where the priests gathered around. And they had to stoop down, no doubt, for two and a quarter feet and to break the in, and to partake of the loaves at that point. It's beautiful to see the continuancy of these three, uh, these three uh, pieces of furniture in the tabernacle with the Lord in the midst to see that when God himself, I'm going to change colors here for just a second here, <clears throat> when God himself is in the midst, why we get to have atonement, we get to see propitiation in action, and we get to see communion amongst the saints, amongst his people. And that's precious to see when God is in the midst, all of this coming together. Let's look now at a future tense, and the future tense is um, future tense is uh, uh, Revelation five. Right after the rapture, there we get that scene, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth on all the earth. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea. And all they in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. <clears throat> so we continue on. We continue on and we find out that uh, the, word, uh, the word midst shows up. And here he is in, in a future day. And he is in the middle of the elders, midst of the elders. That's the redeemed company, Old Testament, New Testament saints, the redeemed company. He's in the middle, and obviously 
we've always enjoyed this as as a lamb freshly slain you know the brother in our assembly brings that up and it's a beautiful beautiful thought to understand he's he's when we get to glory someday we're not going to see you know um scars you know it says wounds what are these wounds in thy hands right that's the beautiful thing is is that freshness is going to be there in glory we're going to see who he was and who he is and it's not going to get old time is not going to wear on those wounds but here's a lamb freshly slain and it says that um there's there unto him that sits upon the throne so there's a blessing honor the glory that goes forth that's a future heavenly scene there in that snapshot in revelation 5. i'm going to read this too this particular portion has been on my heart here in the last couple of weeks here because it brings up something else too and i just so enjoyed this in in uh, a few years past when I was reading this, Revelation 7, verse 9 through 17. And after this I beheld, and lo, in the great, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds, and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And crowded with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels... All the angels which stood round about the throne, round about the throne, and about the elders, and about and the, about the four beasts, and fell before the throne, their faces worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said to them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. And I and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living waters, living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. <clears throat> well, I would like to um, I like to tie together um, two things here, and and in the tying I like to tie this together with. Um, this has been precious to me here where we have these angels standing round about the throne and about the elders. There's something about being about, there's something about being in a circle. And that means that something, someone is in the midst, right? But here down here, this company here that is washed, uh, that came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes. They're martyrs. They're martyrs in the great tribulation. And, um, and, and they stand before the throne of God, before the throne of God. You know, and I've been meditating upon this, and <clears throat> certainly um, some writers have written on this as well. But think about the difference between standing before and standing around. You know, and it reminds me of a dinner table, say, at a restaurant particularly uh, in this day and age, where, we, where a restaurant is and a table is, and there are those that are gathered around the table. Having communion, that's the purpose of, of, of getting around a table to eat, is it not? Uh, yes, it is to sustain our, our, our bodies and such, but there is communion that goes on. But then at a restaurant, why there are waiters and waitresses. These ones come to serve, and they stand before the table, do they not? They don't sit down to the table. They're not sitting around they are standing before the table. And I think that's just precious to see the position that we're brought into right now is to see that we have the privilege to be gathered around, around his table now and around his throne then. But there is a beautiful little snippet I've enjoyed coming out of Revelation 7 there of a future day. And again, not and, and, and again to stress this as well, to stress this again, I can't reiterate this more, is that fact is that the lamb is in the midst of the throne. That's where he desires to be. He's in the midst of the throne. And he also desires to feed them and lead them into living waters. 
that's the preciousness of him being in the midst is that he has desire to feed them and to lead them. So as we proceed on here, the Lord Jesus desires, he desires to be in the midst. And yet we have this little portion here um, in an early part of Revelation here, the seven churches. And here we see here, notably the first church, the church of Ephesus here, where it says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, we can see in the prior chapter that's defined as coming defining as, as the seven churches that he's about ready to address in these uh, chapter two and chapter three. But there he's seen holding the seven stars and walking in the midst. However, however, when we get down into the last church, it says here, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And here we have the last church, Laodicea. And Laodicea is one where we're given the snapshot of the Lord Jesus being on the outside, knocking on the door. He has a desire. He has a desire to sup with you and he has a desire to sup with me but unfortunately it's been it's been noted that the church and sometimes can take up Christ's name as as we have in various forms various denominations and in taking up his name we've set him outside and he's still knocking on the door so I thought this was interesting here in the first church, the vision that we have, in the seventh church, the vision of what we have of being outside, he does desire to be in the midst. And lastly here, for where two or three are gathered into my name, together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You know, um, there's that portion in uh, <clears throat> Luke and... Um, Luke, uh, Luke 22, 15, and he said unto them, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. As he's talking to his disciples, that final line on Passover night, there is a fervency desire to eat that Passover with them. And you know, you consider this and you kind of match this with Matthew 18, 20. Do we not see the fervency of him being in the midst? We've seen that in the Old Testament as he's sitting there in um, amongst the Israelites there in the wilderness. We see that in Revelation. We see that in a future day where he's in the midst. But he desires to be in the midst today as well. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So a question that has come up in my head, in my mind, for me to ponder is, since his desire is to be in the midst, do I see him in the midst around his table? And that's something that uh, should exercise every one of us. Here we are sitting on a Saturday evening, and we have tomorrow the Lord's Day where his table, <clears throat> hopefully you have the ability to be at his table on the Lord's Day and to see the Lord Jesus in the midst. I'd like to close with uh, uh, two two verses out of uh, song, uh, out of uh, Little Flock hymn number 150. We know them well. The f uh, first verse is, Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. God manifest, God seen and heard, the heaven's beloved one. Worthy, O Lamb of God, art thou, that every knee to thee should bow. Verse 6. Of the vast universe of bliss, the center, thou, and sun. A little play on words there, a little analogy there about the sun being in the midst of our little physical universe. But the center, thou, he wants to be in the midst. The eternal theme of praise is this, to heaven's beloved one. Worthy, O Lamb of God, art thou, that every knee to thee should bow. So, with that, 
that's been on my heart to show forth we've had a tremendous time again I can't appreciate enough the uh, the time that we've had the last six uh, webinars here in the winter time seeing forth our Lord Jesus and who he is and here we have him presented in the midst in the past tense and in the future tense but also <clears throat> to be able to see him in the present tense because here's what I enjoyed as well <clears throat> we have two meetings many of us have two meetings that we get to enjoy we have the breaking of bread and we also have a collective prayer meeting <clears throat> and in both of these things we get the opportunity to part to be at the Lord's table and in his midst in his midst particularly and to consider this is that someday and it could be any day when the shout comes we will no longer have the opportunity to be gathered around a loaf and a cup or be gathered in collective prayer because we'll see him face to face so remind yourself and as I'm reminded that as we go through each and every time in a collective manner why that there would be um, the recognition that perhaps this might be the last time that we be caught up to glory or maybe perhaps we don't make it to the next meeting because of the Lord taking us home in some fashion but to have the recognition that this could be the last one and certainly with the way things are going right now in this world it could very well be the last one any moment that we have and so it's a precious thing to think about this to see the desire that the Lord Jesus wants to be in the midst to give him honor and glory 